Hello, I am Samantha Ravitch, Chair of the Center on Cyber and Technology Innovation at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Thank you so much for joining us. America's critical infrastructure is only as strong as its weakest link. And in the United States, water may be the greatest vulnerability. The United States has approximately 52,000 drinking water and 16,000 wastewater systems, most of which service small to medium-sized communities of less than 50,000 residents. Each of these systems operate in a unique threat environment, often with limited budgets and even more limited cybersecurity personnel to respond to these threats. Conducting federal oversight of and providing sufficient federal assistance to such a distributed network of utilities is inherently difficult. Water infrastructure is critical to US national security, economic stability, and public health and safety. Building on the work of the congressionally mandated Cyberspace Solarium Commission, FDD published a research memo highlighting the current state of cybersecurity in the water sector. The role of the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, in supporting the sector and offered recommendations to address policy gaps to support water organizations. The report really has opened up people's eyes to how this most vital of resources can be put into jeopardy by our adversaries. The CSC 2.0 project, which was established by Cyber Solar Cyberspace Solarium Commissioners as in and is continuing the work of the commission, has recently published model legislative text for implementing some of the report's recommendations into law. We are fortunate to have three experts with a mix of industry, government, and congressional expertise to discuss these issues. A few qu quick words about FDD before we get started. FDD is a nonpartisan research institute exclusively focused on national security and foreign policy. FDD houses three centers on American power and produces actionable research and develops policy options to strengthen US national security. FDD proudly accepts no funds from foreign governments or corporations. For more information on our work, we encourage you to visit our website, fdd.org. You can also follow us at, at FDD on Twitter. And with that, though, I am pleased to virtually welcome Representative Jim Langevin to give some opening remarks. Congressman Langevin is a senior member of the House Armed Services Committee, where he serves as chairman of the Cyber Innovative Technologies and Information Systems Subcommittee, a national leader on securing our nation's infrastructure against cyber threats. I had the distinct honor of serving alongside him on the Cyberspace Solarian Commission and to call him a friend. His commitment to public service over the past two decades, especially on the issues of cybersecurity and critical infrastructure protection is unequaled. So welcome Congressman Langevin. Hello everyone, I'm Jim Langevin. And for the past 22 years, I've proudly represented the second congressional district of Rhode Island in the United States House of Representatives. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person with everyone today, but I'm grateful for the opportunity to say a few words on the cybersecurity of our water sector. The water sector provides some of our society's most core essential services. Access to drinking water and properly treated wastewater are baseline functions a society must fulfill to support modern life and public health. The water sector also supports the functionality of many of the other 15 critical infrastructure sectors in this country. It's for these reasons that cyber threats to our water sector should generate serious concern. Yet we know that from CISA, the FBI, NSA, and EPA, that known and unknown cyber actors are attempting to compromise both information technology and operational technology assets at water treatment facilities. Now we've seen what cyber attacks against our water sector can do. Last year in Oldsmar, Florida, a hacker tried to, to poison the city's water supply by increasing its sodium hydroxide content to extremely dangerous levels. Fortunately, quick action by an operator at the facility thwarted the attack, but it demonstrated that underinvestments in water sector cybersecurity could lead to disaster. Unfortunately, we've been flirting with such a disaster for years. In the Cyberspace Solarium Commission's final report, we looked at cybersecurity of the water sector and noted that, and I quote, 
water utilities remain largely ill-prepared to defend their networks from cyber enabled disruptions, end quote. Adherence to existing cybersecurity guidance has been inconsistent with many utilities lacking the resources they need to fully meet recommendations from the water sector associations and the EPA, the Water Sector and Sector Risk Management Agency, or SRMA. Yet the EPA itself also faces challenges in meeting its responsibilities when it comes to the day-to-day -day relationship between the federal government and their water sector. While the EPA is not only the SRMA that faces such challenges, we further noted in the Slayer Commission's final report that there remains, and I quote, insufficient coordination between the EPA and other stakeholders in water utility security, end quote. Knowing what we know about the cyber threats facing the water sector, this status quo simply cannot continue. The risks are too great. So we need to raise the bar among water utilities across the country building capacity and strengthening adherence to industry-wide standards. And we need to ensure that the EPA is appropriately resourced and empowered to fulfill its critical mission as a sector risk management agency for water. CSC 2.0 has taken a hard look at how we can accomplish these goals and carry out the commission's work forward. Today's event is an important step forward in turning ideas into action and we've successfully done so many times before. As we move forward, I invite you all to engage with my office on this issue. Finding legislative solutions to difficult cybersecurity problems is not always easy, so we need to make sure that we get them right. But I'm optimistic about our prospects for success if we work together. So thank you and enjoy the rest of today's event. Thank you, Congressman Langevin, again, for your remarks and your service. So I'm now pleased to bring in today's panelists. Joining us, we have Kevin Morley, who is Manager of Federal Relations for the American Water Works Association. We also have Ken Kaposis, former Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Office of Water in the Environmental Protection Agency. And finally, my colleague, retired Rear Admiral Mark Montgomery, who serves as Senior Director of FDD's Center on Cyber and Technology Innovation, and he previously served as Executive Director of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. So Mark, I'm going to begin with you. FDD recently completed a report that highlighted the water sector as the weakest link in our national critical infrastructure. Could you take a moment to describe the challenges we are facing in the sector and, and why it concerns you? Uh, thank you, uh, Samantha, and, and thanks to Representative Langevin as well. And, and as you, me, and Representative Langevin remember, when we were on the Cyberspace Layering Commission, we did uh, indicate in our final report that there were a number of critical infrastructures that concerned us. Uh, pipelines was on, this was pre-colonial. Um, uh, uh, water was another. And uh, you know, the uh, the commissioners had us take a, a deep dive on this. And, and I, I do think it's fair that, you know, our conclusion that, that uh, America's critical infrastructures are only as strong as their weakest link, and, and water infrastructure could be the greatest vulnerability in, in these infrastructures. And really, the significant cybersecurity deficiencies that we observed in the drinking water and wastewater sectors resulted really from structural challenges. There wasn't a specific human or person that, that, that caused these. The, you know, the United States has literally 52,000 drinking water systems, 16,000 wastewater. And a lot of these are just service small and medium sized communities, less than 50,000 citizens. And, and as a result, these utilities, and they're, I think 88% of the water is delivered by public sector utilities. So these systems operate with uh, limited budgets and, and even more so a limited number of cybersecurity personnel and, and expertise. So conducting effective federal oversight in, in the best of times is really difficult and providing sufficient federal assistance to such a distributed network is also inherently difficult. And uh, what we had found is that really driving one you know, or compounding this challenge uh, was uh, something we experienced about 20 years ago, maybe even 30 years ago, which was the increasing automation of the water sector. You know, the, the removal of linemen who walked and operated valves and pumps and manually inserted the chemical uh, the chemicals to, to purify the water properly. Um, you know, they had been replaced by uh, electronically controlled systems, uh, IT and OT systems. Uh, and this was done at a time when there was realistically 
no perceivable adversarial threat, either nation state or criminal to these water systems. So as a result, cybersecurity wasn't baked in. And I think all of us who work in cybersecurity know that the hardest way to fix a cybersecurity problem is when you have to fix, when you have to reverse engineer it back into systems. That's going to be the most expensive, painful, difficult solution. Um, so the, you know, the, the, this automation though did reduce costs, uh, and it, and it, uh, and it did facilitate better regulatory compliance in a lot of areas. But uh, I think because of what I said about not having a threat, the utilities did not invest the savings from the automation into the cybersecurity of the new systems that relied so, um, so much on, on cyber, on IT, OT, uh, and, and, uh, ICS, and SCADA, you know, all acronyms that have to do with the, um, the, the uh, maneuvering of water through the system. Um, Listen, this also then gave the adversary an expanded attack surface before where he probably could have only attacked the billing system of a water utility. They can now go after the field operations. And it, and it can also lead to disruptive and cascading effects. If you have similar software management systems at multiple utilities, you could have multiple attacks conducted simultaneously. Uh, and so, you know, this really is a challenge. And that is the challenge that faces the utilities. Uh, I think Compounding this further is that the federal government agency, the, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, which is was originally called the Sector Specific Agency, but is now called the Sector Risk Management Agency. That's the agency that bears the responsibility for supporting the water utilities. It has not historically been resourced or organized to support the cybersecurity needs of the water se sector, particularly when you think about it consistent with the scope and the scale of the challenges the sector faces. So this is a perfect storm. You have the private sector really challenged and the conditions getting significantly harder and worse over the last 20 to 25 years and owned and operated by public utilities, which don't have the, e the ease of raising capital or the ability to change rates in the same, with the same speed and agility of a private sector company. And it's, and it's married to a sector risk management agency that has a lot of number one challenges and has not put the, the appropriate investments into this. And so what I'd kind of say is, does it matter? Of course it matters. Water, particularly the drinking water portion, but all water infrastructure is critical to national security, economic stability, and probably most importantly, pu public health and safety. So we really do need to tackle this. And that was the, uh, that was the kind of challenge that we envisioned up front. Yeah, that's, that's great. Certainly attacking an adversary's Water system is as old as the Bible, but uh, what you talk about, Mark, brings it into the 21st century. Um, so, so Ken, you headed the Office of Water in the EPA several administrations ago. So why is the cybersecurity threat such a challenge for the agency to tackle? Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one, of course, is the just trying to identify the nature of the threat. Uh, a second one is the uh, the fact that uh, these 52,000 water providers that have been identified uh, are scattered all across the country and they operate independent of each other. And, and as Mark said, it's some 80 plus percent it is provided by uh, a small number of those providers, but there's a large number of them out there. And then the, there's also another cause and that's the perpetual reason at EPA is that they're, they're under-resourced for the activities that they're tasked to undertake. There's no doubt that EPA recognizes the threat and has taken some steps to address it, but um, it's within a universe where uh, EPA's workforce is some 3,000 individuals fewer than it was 20 years ago. Uh, their budget is $3 billion less than their budget was uh, 20 years ago. And uh, the needs that for the agency to undertake these kinds of activities have only increased. So um, what I see is that EPA and EPA, as I said, because of resources, isn't really equipped. And uh, as they try to balance how to undertake these responsibilities, it's uh, it's just something that they need to do. I do think that there are opportunities for the agency out there. Um, and I think some of the work that you all are doing has, has helps lay the groundwork for undertaking those kinds of activities. And perhaps we can get into a little bit more of that later. That's great. Um, 
Uh, yesterday, Mark and I were on a panel on, on uh, the cyber workforce in the federal government um, and the, the need for new ways to bring in new talent. Uh, Ken, you kind of touched upon those needs at, at EPA, so there's certainly cross-fertilization from the report that we talked about yesterday to this, this topic at hand today. Um, uh, Mark, let me just go back to you for a second um, before I get to Kevin. Uh, uh, recently, the team at CSC 2.0 rolled out some model legislative text to address the issues raised in, in the original Cyberspace Solarium and our FDD report. But one of the most challenging was a call for establishing a water risk and resilience organization, WRRO. Can you, can you explain a little bit about what that is and what you were trying to achieve? Yeah, Samantha, thanks. And, you know, broadly in, in that, in the overall kind of framing the, I think six recommendations we had, it was the idea was that we'd layer an approach which would combine strengthening the EPA, improving government financial support and oversight, and then a strong partnership between government and utilities to result in a more secure, reliable and resilient sector. Very specifically to get at that third element was the idea of establishing a water risk and resilience organization. So this is, uh, you know, kind of a, our, our vision here is a sector led organization. And that's because at this time, you know, without getting into all the nitty gritty, the EPA's water cybersecurity team is, you know, you can count, you can count the total number of people on, on one hand, uh, three finger Brown might've been able to cut them all on one hand. Uh, and, and, and the idea is that, you know, it, because of that lack of capacity right now in EPA, we need a sector-led organization to manage the development of mandatory cybersecurity standards and oversee compliance with them. But because you have to have federal oversight, this approach does account for federal oversight by that limited EPA team, which separately we recommend growing significantly. But that federal oversight, and, and it would be focused on defining requirements for the standards. So the EPA would be very specifically working with, with NIST, the National um, uh, Institute for Standards and Technology at the Department of Commerce on defining the requirements for standards and getting approval for their use uh, for implementation by the sector-led organization. So the EPA would be the federal uh, oversight agency. You'd also have technical support in this from CISA. I also think the Department of Energy, CISA is the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency at um, uh, the Department of Homeland Security. And, and again, EPA is the lead, but CISA does provide routine support to all sector risk management agencies. This wouldn't be any different. And then uh, I do think the Department of Energy could also provide some cybersecurity expertise into this because they have been running uh, similar utilities uh, based uh, sector led organizations and, and what, what's called the uh, North American Electric Reliability Corporation, the NERC. So I think DOE could help there. Um, but I do think the water sector would manage the standards development process, uh, the implementation, and then, you know, so we can use the expertise that reside in organizations like Kevin's and, and like the, the, the various uh, associations that are in the water ISAC and, you know, the other organizations like Amway, and there's a, there's a good number, six or seven water sector organizations. But the idea here clearly is a sector-led organization with EPA oversight that manages and develops mandatory cybersecurity standards. All right, Kevin, I'm not just going to let you rest on your laurels with the great work that you do at the American Water Works Association. So, so now I'm turning to you. Um, this water risk and resilience organization that Mark was just talking about seems, seems very sim uh, similar to, to something that your organization has been working with, with a, a friend of mine, Paul Stockton. Um, what do you think of the WRRO recommendation and, and how might it be improved? Yeah, thanks. I uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all today. Um, uh, you know, AWWA, uh, amongst the uh, the various work organizations, has has worked for a number of years to elevate the the visibility and awareness of the cybersecurity threat to the sector, and uh, and that includes uh, one of the things that we've done. Uh, is develop some some guidance uh, and approach to how the utility could use in this cybersecurity framework. And so as we move forward here in the last uh, couple of years with some statutory obligations, but also especially on the heels of, you know, this last year with solar winds, the, the Oldsmar incident in the water sector and, and Colonial, um, 
it became very clear that that you know more something more was necessary and so uh, we worked with our leadership to evaluate what are the options right status quo uh, direct you know direct implementation from the federal agency or what we've uh, likened uh, in the work that we did with Paul Stockton we would call a co-regulatory model right it's a shared responsibility there's important elements from our federal partners and there's important elements from the the asset owner operators and in, in taking an initiative and i don't we came to the conclusion Samantha that um, you know this was not something that could be wholly done strictly with the federal family or um, strictly within the sector and it, it required this co-regulatory approach and so uh, we very much like the idea the the the, con, the framework of the model from the electric sector we think there's a lot of value in that shared uh, shared burden, if you will, recognizing the capacity issues that that Mark noted with with EPA. Um, but unlike the electric sector, we're not starting with a blank sheet of paper, right? There's a lot of knowledge that has been developed on what best practices would be. And so we think uh, we would be in a position uh, to move rather expediently to establish some baseline minimum cybersecurity practices, but as Ken noted, right, there, there's a, a huge scale in uh, the size and complexity of utility operations that necessitates uh, a, a tiered risk-based approach, right? What's good for the small town I grew up in, in in upstate New York is is not necessarily what's appropriate for, say, a DC or a Chicago, just because of the complexity. Half the stuff wouldn't apply where, where I was from, for example, uh, or perhaps. And so, that requires a, a more subject matter expertise from the sector. And we think that something like the Water Risk and Resilience Organization can provide uh, the forum by which uh, that knowledge can be collected and organized in a manner that is most productive in advancing cybersecurity in the sector. Again, as Mark noted, with oversight from EPA on uh, the approval process and uh, if push comes to shove, um, you know, uh, having some enforcement oversight uh, for those uh, entities that opt to not implement the appropriate protocols. So that, I mean, again, this is again not getting down to the details, but I think that's a really we we see this as a shared approach, and and uh, AWWA and and some of the other organizations have have recognized that a sector led effort in partnership with EPA is is really essential to uh, advancing. In, in an expedient manner. So I'm going to go back to Kenton in a second, but but before I do, um, Kevin, you you know you you have your finger on the pulse and talk obviously throughout the water, various water organizations and and utilities. You know what are they familiar with this idea yet? What you know what are you hearing back as as this is kind of starting to bubble up? Yeah, I I think you know. It's 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 usually odd as as Mark and I have chatted before for for some for a sector to advocate for regulation, right? But when when you lay out the options on the table and the reality of of and and the um, you know the business case for why this is important, uh, folks, as I've gone around the country and talked about this process, uh, they recognize the value of this type of approach and have been reasonably accepting of that provision. Granted, we haven't worked out the details of the what and the how, but uh, they recognize the need to, to raise the bar on cybersecurity and, and our board and, and leadership have, have embraced that process and are you know, seeking uh, to continue support for that. So appreciate this opportunity to talk about it further. Great. So, so Ken, again, for the audience, uh, you know, just making it clear, you are not now at the EPA. You had been at the EPA, um, but knowing knowing uh, the agency, how do you think that they would respond to this this recommendation in particular? Well, I, I, I think that my my experience over the over the long time of working at EPA and with, and with EPA is um, is is a level of re receptivity. I really do. I think that. Um, you know, the EPA has long worked with its uh, with its its regulating partners out uh, in the water sector, 
Um, and sometimes uh, the relationship gets a little stormy because EPA has certain things by law they're required to do, but this is an area where they don't necessarily have a, a legal standard that Congress has told them that they have to meet. So if it were me, my counsel to EPA would be, the first thing I'd wanna do is, is, is uh, follow up to what Kevin was suggesting, and that is to sit down with the utilities and, uh, and jointly identify what are the needs, what are the threats, what are the vulnerabilities. As Kevin rightly says, that vulnerabilities in New York City are not the same as some small town in upstate New York. They, and, and if you tried to come up with a single set of answers, it simply wouldn't work, uh, particularly for the smaller communities, and it'd be way inadequate for the larger ones. So there would be a, a process to, I, I, to uh, work with the utilities and, and recognize what everybody's talents are. I think initially a lot of the utilities are going to be asking, uh, how can I get some help? And EPA is going to be asking, how can we help? That's going to be the that's going to be the key question rather than EPA saying this is how we're going to help you and trust us it will. Um, then I think that um, there's going to be some needs uh, to identify technologies related to security vulnerabilities etc. Kind of as Mark was talking about, um, EPA working again with the utilities can help. Uh, uh, help advance where they could offer expertise. And it doesn't have to be solely within the EPA, as Mark identified. There's a lot of expertise across the federal government. EPA is probably never going to have the internal capability to, to handle all those needs, but only an agency like EPA can bring the other agencies in. And so I think once these once the needs and vulnerabilities are, tech are recognized, once some answers are, are, uh, are developed, then I think that my world, I, I would have EPA support these solutions financially. Uh, they're not going to be in a position to pay 100% of the cost, but I do think that one way that's proven to be successful over the years is, is a joint partnership and investment in carrying out these responsibilities. So that's kind of a, a, a very, uh, it, it, my, my three-pronged uh, stool, if you will, uh, but I think, that, I think that's going to be a, a path to at least open up the opportunity for success. Um, I think that sets the stage very well for, for kind of the next question that I'm going to ask Mark, because he had some very strong recommendations for strengthening EPA, um, especially in this role as a sector risk management agency, um, you know, and it goes to what EPA can and should and should be tasked legislatively and otherwise to do. Um, Mark, maybe you could kind of walk us through some of these recommendations. Thanks, you are. And uh, that was a delicate way of putting it. I, uh, I'm probably not on EPA's Christmas card list right now, but I'm okay with that because I think these recommendations are things that EPA's uh, leadership and future leadership are, are going to appreciate if we can if we can get them into law. Um, very. I mean, I'll cut right to the. I'll, I'll do the conclusion first. The conclusion is we have to change the budget of the Office of the Division of Water Cybersecurity within the Office of Water. Um, from what I can tell, it's it's hard to pin it all down, um, but the uh, it looked like about they, they have a portion, probably six or seven million dollars of a fifteen million dollar budget uh, for cybersecurity. So the the six or seven millions for cybersecurity that might be a tiny bit high. Um, uh, and what we're recommending is that you grow that. Now, look, the final number needs to probably be around forty five million. It does not work in the federal government to go from six or seven million to forty five million. That's called putting money in a 55 gallon barrel and burning it. Um, you know, you have to grow gradually. And so we recommend a gradual grow to 15 million a year dedicated to this to uh, eventually 30 million a year and then 45. Um, and uh, but what are they doing? What they're doing is something that is very specifically you know, that is that is called out for all the sector risk management agencies. And that's the concept of you have to support the sector's risk management effort. You have to run programs that assist the owners and operators in IDing uh, and understanding and mitigating threats and vulnerabilities. You don't have to do it yourself. Sometimes you can hire or um, or second other organizations. If you had a water, water risk and resilience uh, organization, you could do that. You can, in the absence of that, you can use associations uh, like AWWA or AMWA or the Water ISAC. Um, and uh, but you have to have guidance. If you go on the EPA website now. You know, it's it's very disconcerting to read the language around like assessments where it says we don't provide a standard. I mean, it, it proactively says not us, and and it, it needs to be proactively us. And when you look at energy webs, if you look at other sector risk management agencies that are succeeding, they have they have an opposite um, approach. Um, but they also have to help with very specific 
um, risk identification and assessments. And that's what I was getting at. They have to actually help provide the, the, uh, the, um, the templates for these, these assessments. And they have to, and, and this is important because they need, and I think eventually they need to get these back because one of their requirements is they're supposed to tell the Department of Homeland Security, what's the national risk that we face in the water industry? And I don't know how EPA could do that right now without getting you know, some kind of acknowledgement from, um, from the utilities. And again, if you had a, a centralized uh, resilience, you know, WRO, you could reach into somebody to get that answer. In the absence of that, it's going to be a lot of work. Um, I think they have to do coordination, you know, to be that kind of day-to-day -day federal interface. Again, I think they try to do that. They're reason they're really undermanned to do it. Um, but they also have to serve as the government coordinating council chair, something they do, and they have to participate in cross-sector coordinating councils with with energy and others, which they do. And I think that takes up a lot of their day-to-day -day workload uh, for the limited number of people they have, and, and that worries me because that. That that coordination is important, but if you're not doing any of the the work with the ligature work with the sector, really doesn't matter if you're running an excellent meeting. Um, they have to be a participant in the threat and vulnerability information sharing. Now, here's a place where the department, you know, the director of national intelligence plays a role. CISA, as we mentioned earlier, plays a role. I, th I think EPA is more of a facilitator here, making sure you make the connections between the utilities, uh, you know, the the, the the, the 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 private sector, so to speak, or utilities, and and the federal government's information, um, and that will inherently, and I think Ken mentioned that there, these are critical roles played by the federal agencies. They have to do the incident management for water and wastewater sector. I think that's something they do now. Um, you know, probably the you know the the workload is going to increase, and this goes. This is why they're put with their. Disaster management, you know, they're co-located with the disaster management. Same way in, in energy, a, a big organization in energy that is the equivalent to the water organization that we're envisioning. It's got, you know, 20 fold the budget and 10 fold the people of the current water organization, but it handles, um, you know, cybersecurity and emergency response. And so I think similarly, you do that in water. And then, you know, kind of supporting emergency preparedness, helping people develop the plans they need for resiliency, for response and recovery from issues. So this is really important. It goes beyond cyber. It is about creating an overall uh, lowered national risk, um, you know, management. And so to me, the, the, this is critical. And this is, this takes, there's no way around it. This takes money. And look, this is a lot of this is a new mission. In fairness to EPA, we should not be saying, hey, tell us where you're taking that. What lead abatement program are you taking that money from? Because nothing went away as you brought in this cyber, uh, these, these cyber requirements. So they really need this kind of, in my mind, this kind of plus up uh, of 15 uh, to 30 million, you know, you know, from 5 million or 6 million, whatever it is now, to 15 million to 30 million to eventually 45 million. This is a big, this is a large number. Is this, gets people, uh, you know, it's not large compared to like the overall cost of lead abatement programs, for example, but it's large in terms of the administrative management of, uh, of EPA. And, and those numbers are sometimes really, really tightly managed by the appropriators. But I think this, there is an excellent argument for this. We're trying to make it from the outside. We hope EPA embraces this. I, I, uh, I don't remain optimistic. I don't have optimism about that, but, but I, I think that this is a reasonable approach to get EPA in a better position to provide the oversight that's required, either for the WRO or if it's an you know in, in some longer term vision, a EPA led um, se uh, sector standard management. Oh, I, I think you'll get more than a Christmas card. I, I'm I'm hoping for a gift basket for you. I, I think you know your recommendations are are going to go over um, that well, but. You know, and they're they're good. They're obviously incredibly important recommendations. Can we all understand that agencies and departments have their own culture, right? And so, what are what are your thoughts, advice, guidance on on helping the you know the agency to, to open up? Like, well, how will they receive this? Are there ways to get them to realize, as, as Mark said, this is not a this is not a bash EPA, and this is also a recognition that you know, EPA is going to need more resources to be able to do these things. But what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I, I would expect that the agency would be receptive to, uh, to 
uh, looking at the at looking at the recommendations and advice of people from the outside. Certainly in my time at the agency, I spent an enormous amount of time meeting with outside experts who uh, helped inform the uh, agency in its decision making process. I think that it's going to be it's going to be important for Congress to uh, recognize that this is a need. I think that uh, one of the things that uh, talked about I've talked about in the past, we discussed it a bit in, in the transition uh, of cybersecurity and uh, in its relationship to physical security. Nobody expects that uh, people are going to be able to defend this country th through armies, air forces, and navies. Um, we have a structure in place to do that. And I think that so many of the uh, instances that we've seen lately have demonstrated that cybersecurity is as much a threat to the US uh, health and safety and the economy as an outside military force. Uh, it may not be as destructive, but it can certainly be as, as threatening and, as, and disruptive to everyday life and including uh, the loss of life. And so EPA clearly will need resources to do this. Um, it's no secret that uh, there are a substantial number of members of the Congress who don't think very highly of EPA uh, in its regulatory function. But this isn't about a regulatory function. This is about taking care of people in their communities. And it has to be sold that way. Uh, to uh, justify those kinds of, of monetary increases. Congress can tell, can give EPA a, a plus up in its budget and can be very specific on what it can be spent on. Um, so it doesn't fold into the regulatory program that so many people seem to dislike, but it would instead be a direct benefit to the communities. And from the bottom up, it would also be very helpful for these elected members of Congress to hear from the water utilities of, hey, we want you to fund this program at EPA. We need you to fund this program at EPA uh, because if it's just the if it's just the, the president's budget asking for the money, all that some people will see is oh there's EPA asking for more money and we're not going to give it to them. So it's it, it's it's not an easy task, but I think the criticality of the task is what has to be explained to people. And once that is, then I think there's a way to generate support. Um, Kevin, you've worked with EPA uh, alongside EPA for a number of years. I mean, what do you think about these recommendations to, to strengthen the agency? And as a second part of that, and kind of keying off of what Ken said, we had a question from Suzanne Smalley asking if industry has actually asked the EPA for kind of a more aggressive or involved, let's say, regulatory structure. Yeah, some good good points there. So we, uh, I, I guess, I think overall the, the the elements of of what Mark was talking about, I, I think, provide a little more a little bit more structure to how uh, EPA is involved as a sector risk management agency and and provides some some important resources and and direction as to how that's allocated and directed. And uh, as I said before. You know, AWWA, amongst other things, is a standards development organization. So, we we have developed standards within this realm of of uh, all hazards, risk and resilience, and emergency response uh, that uh, EPA has often participated in and, and supported. And so, uh, we believe that that approach provides some more substance to that that activity. Uh, in terms of resourcing, I think uh, to Ken's point, you know, it's it's nice to have things on paper here in Washington, but at the end of the day, uh, what what is most effective in supporting, you know, change in behavior, i.e., implementation, and that that's a little bit of capacity development. And I think through some of the points that Mark made and, and some of the elements in that provision, you know, supporting capacity development, as as Ken well knows, you know, there's a number of programs that focused on on small medium systems and and getting them that knowledge transfer, right? Just yelling at people and saying, do multi-factor authentication without really demonstrating how that goes about is, is, is a piece of the puzzle that's really important to, to bring in everybody along. Um, we have had conversations with the agency and uh, they are aware of our interests. Uh, I think uh, there, there perhaps is a little bit of difficulty uh, in, in seeing outside the box. It, it is a very different approach than what has traditionally been in the water sector. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, they are unreceptive to it, but I think, you know, 
the devil's in the details, and, and they certainly have some other uh, actions that they're looking at within their current kind of regulatory construct um, that um, I'll just put it on the table. None of the associations uh, are supportive of. This would be integrating cybersecurity into the sanitary survey program, which is a little bit of a burden transfer on the state primacy agencies who also have limited capacity. And so part of the model that we're talking about here with the WRO is, is recognizing those, those resource constraints. And it really comes down to uh, this collaborative trust in, in who, who, who is doing the what. And uh, we believe this more distributed approach through a third party organization that can provide that audit function and, and valuation, evaluation, if you will, of, of how utilities are implementing uh, the standards that we talk about. The output of that is what's really important. And that, that information can be shared with the state and can be shared with the agency to uh, address those interests of what is the status of the sector and how are things going. And then ideally, you know, the majority of the sector typically, you know, moves along pretty well in terms of compliance on these things. And, you know, I think there's an opportunity here with some of the resources Mark talked about that if a utility is having difficulty getting there, you know, there's opportunity for technical support to help bring them along and not just, you know, hit them with a sledgehammer for an enforcement action, which isn't necessarily in the general interest. What we're really trying to do is, is uh, support uh, implementation of change in cybersecurity so that ultimately the public health of the community serve is, is protected as best as possible. Well, you know, it's, it's, um, it's important to kind of underscore that you're talking about, you know, bringing the capacity to the states and, and you know, down to the, where the utilities are operating because obviously People aren't going to die of, of thirst at the federal level, right? Or, you know, or, you know, God forbid, in any other way. It's at the local level. <laughs> it is where they drink their water, is where they need their water. Um, and, you know, Mark's, Mark's team did recommend some changes that would direct um, state revolving funds to spend more on cybersecurity. And so what do you think of, of that in particular? Any other means to achieve this type of support um, to utilities that haven't yet been mentioned? Yeah, I, I think the important thing with that particular provision of the, of the model of legislation that's important is, is, is the recognition that, that this isn't a, a no cost option, right? If we want utilities to move along with some degree of expedient, then some resources are gonna need, need to be provided to facilitate implementation. Um, I, I'm not 100% certain that, that a, an explicit carve out within the SRF program is, is, the, is, the, is the most prudent uh, approach, but, but that aside, the mechanics of that are really important. And, and there are certainly other uh, programs that, that Ken can probably speak to and, and with more expertise than I, but like the STAG grant program, because. One, one of the limiting factors in, in the SRF program, not to get too down into the weeds, is that if that can really support what we would traditionally call CapEx kind of funding, it is not supportive of, of OpEx. So if I, as a small or medium utility, are, am transitioning to some sort of security as a service, like cloud or I want to use AWS or, or some other service to support the security of the IT or OT infrastructure, that's now considered a subscription, if you will, and, and is, is operations and maintenance. That's not eligible under the SRF program. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't, you know, nuts and bolts kind of things that need can be funded through the SRF program, but that is the that is one concerning constraint um, that, that I would have with that particular um, uh, funding mechanism. Uh, but certainly I think the important thing is the recognition that some additional funding support, because comparatively, as Mark wrote in the report, you know, the funding allocated to cybersecurity in the water sector compared to say our, our colleagues in the electric sector is, is de minimis, right? So it's like, I forget Mark, but it's like 250 million in grants for roughly 3000 utilities. We've got nothing for 52,000 utilities plus 16,000 wastewater systems. So, you know, 
if we're serious about the issue, then then we we're going to need to put some some uh, some muscle behind it to make the changes that we think are important. You know, so yeah. I, the, that's a great point Kevin had there. That you know, the, the, the real you you know you're kind of right when it's the solution that was used for another you know uh, uh, you know for the most similar infrastructure energy. You know, in the infrastructure bill, we absolutely this is the bipartisan infrastructure act last year. We 100% took care of the cybersecurity, addressed the cybersecurity issue with the energy utilities with a $250 million program. And then, you know, when you move over to the to the water side, they're like cybersecurity competes with, you know, drought, climate change, natural disasters, rising sea levels, you know, the four signs of the apocalypse, or you can invest a little bit in cybersecurity. You know, obviously the big four get taken care of. And so, you know, to prevent that kind of thinking, which is li- which is uh, human, um, you know, you need uh, you know the 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 Congress took care of energy, did not take care of water. Sorry to jump in, but you know, Kevin mentioned it, and he's absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, um, uh, Ken, I want you to get to you know jump in here um, on on the DRF or other ways that you think that. Um, increased funding or assistance is best gotten for cybersecurity uh, efforts to the utilities. And, you know, again, well, I, you're, you're just saying again, you are no longer at EPA, so I, you can think broadly and uh, don't have to clear anything with anyone. Well, I think that uh, be, because of the because of the resource constraints that have been placed on the agency over over these uh, many years, uh, I think that uh, trying to to, uh, to to take money from an existing program and move it into a new purpose um, I think, as Kevin was saying, it, you're, you're, you're starving at one program for the benefit of, of another. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that you might figure that that's a higher and better use for that money than uh, in, you know, investing in an operating cost versus a capital cost, although there will be some capital costs associated with cyber as well, obviously. But uh, I think that, um, you know, I, I'd like to think that we can have a rational conversation uh, with, the, uh, with the Congress and the administration and uh, and recognize that this is a need that has to be treated as a as the serious need that it is. And that that means it's a call for new investment and new investment is new money. Um, I think that uh, I, th- I also think new money will help alleviate some of the concerns at the agency, because so I can tell you, they they always feel pressed. Every time somebody says, oh, you need to do this new thing, then the first thing that the office directors have to say is, where am I going to get the money? Where am I going to take it from? Because I don't have a new pot of money to go spend. Uh, so while I'm not saying that it's going to be uh, a snap to go ahead and, and, and create a uh, new funding for the agency to undertake these steps, I think that it's most likely to be successful if there is a way to find some, some new resources for the agency. They will then be more comfortable in committing their own resources because you're not taking it away from an activity that they've currently identified as, as important to them and or a responsibility that Congress gave them that's non-discretionary and some group is out there waiting just to sue them as soon as they don't do it and put them on a schedule. Uh, and so uh, and so I think that's the way to, to, to try to, to uh, uh, convince people to market it to let people understand that this is really serious. And as I said a little earlier, I think that uh, people have underestimated this risk for way too long uh, because the risk is so diverse uh, out there in, in the 52,000 water utilities. Uh, you know, in the post 9-11 world, we spent a considerable amount of time looking at the vulnerability of water systems. Uh, it wasn't cybersecurity then, it was concerned about water systems being poisoned. Uh, it, it was uh, it was concerned that wastewater facilities all across the country had uh, well blue plains right outside of Washington had tank cars railroad tank cars with chlorine that you could have shot with a rifle from 295 um, and chlorine is highly deadly and it doesn't evap- it doesn't go up it stays along the ground so there, these kinds of vulnerabilities have been identified and the agency can can work with intelligence officials and with the with the utilities. Um, and I'll go back to the point. I, I think it's going to be critical for the agency to understand what the utilities needs are because they are going to be so diverse and what the risks are. And then you start addressing them uh, in, a, in a much more collaborative way. 
Um, Mark, uh, you had one recommendation unique to the smaller rural water utilities. Can you explain what the cybersecurity circuit rider program is and what it's intended to do? Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. And this is a fun one. It's um, uh, actually in the Department of Agriculture, which uh, so we'll take it easy on EPA for a moment here. Um, so the the National um, uh, Rural Water Association Circuit Rider Program, it's it's made up uh, of about 150 circuit riders that work with, you know, the 50 states, I think it happens to be 49 state associations in Puerto Rico. But, you know, so there's a handful of people in, addressing each one. And they work, they provide hands-on training and technical assistance to small rural systems as defined as like 10,000 people or less on an everyday basis, 24 seven. So that's a, you know, they do about 70,000 interactions, you know, training and, and assistance interactions a year with these, uh, with these small utilities. That's a lot of on-site help. It's delivered where it's needed in a rural community. So I kind of vision these guys, they're like, you know, they don't ride horses anymore. You know, the circuit riders are probably like driving F-150s. They got a little bit of extra pipe in the back of the, the, the bed and they're driving around, a lot of tools. And they're helping these guys. They're like, hey, you got to put that, uh, that pipe a little farther away from that pipe kind of stuff. What I don't imagine they're doing is giving any advice on cybersecurity and, and that's been verified. So what we did was suggest, hey, Let's let's augment this with a cybersecurity circuit rider program. Uh, about uh, I think it's five million dollars. That won't quite get us to fifty. We'd have to adjust the money or adjust the number. But I would suggest around fifty circuit rider cybersecurity circuit riders. Now these guys are like driving around in Priuses, right? Uh, not F one fifties, and they're coming in and they're saying, "Hey, uh, you're you're running Windows seven, and you haven't done any patches in four years. Let me explain to you how to get yourself healthy." Uh, you know, and so they provide technical assistance. Sometimes they can probably provide some de minimis support, you know, some limited support in there. Um, I think it's an easy program. Um, I keep it in the Department of Agriculture just because the circuit rider program is there. And I, I don't want to create extra overhead. You just want to pay for bodies, you know, to be thrown up against us and I guess rent some Priuses, you know, but that to me is the idea with this. And I think of, of all the things we've mentioned, it's for several reasons, it's the most likely to happen. The, the number one is uh, that it's uh, in the Department of Agriculture, not EPA, and uh, that removes some angst. But, but number two is it's working on an existing program and it's just providing a, a an added capability or capacity. Um, speaking from a small rural uh, area, I, I thank you for that recommendation, um, as does Ken, I think. Um, so, okay, final, final question, um, but uh, let me start with a, with a quote from a, a very smart man named uh, Kevin Morley, who said that crisis begs bad policy. Um, it has stuck in a number of our heads. Um, so yeah, so crisis. Um, we've discussed a number of pretty dire challenges, a number of proposed recommendations, but you know, what are, what are your thoughts on what may happen in this space over the next, you know, 12 months? Uh, see, you know, crisis on the horizon, or are we going to not have to wait for the crisis um, to get that bad policy that, that Kevin warned us about? <laughs> uh, so let me, let me take Kevin first, and then Ken, and, and then Mark, you can uh, wrap it up. Well, you know, uh, thanks for that, Samantha. I think uh, it's always, you always wonder if anybody's listening, right? <laughs> so um, I, I think part of the reason that we, we took action on, on, and did the, the paper that you mentioned with Paul Stockton was, was you know, uh, to have to move preemptively prior to a crisis to, to have an approach that we felt was, uh, you know, reasonable. To, to move the ball down the field. Is that gonna prevent every possible thing? Absolutely not, I'm, I'm not making that claim, but it, it moves us in the right direction. I think, you know, organizationally ourselves and, and some of the organizations are, are moving forward to, to seek uh, congressional support for uh, something uh, very similar to the WRO that, that uh, you know, Mark and his team has, have proposed that it's very close to what we were talking about. So that's very encouraging and hopeful to see something like that be introduced and, and move the ball down the field. I, I think we're prepared to move ahead uh, even in the absence of that and try to articulate uh, some, some minimum practices with our, with our colleagues in the sector. Uh, some of that obviously needs to align with 
uh, you know, pending revisions to the NIST cybersecurity framework and the performance goals that the White House put together. But I think all those things can reasonably be clued together and, and build on uh, the body of knowledge that we've already created in the sector between ourselves and some of our, our partner organizations and, and be in a better place in a year from now. But from a structural governance perspective, that's going to require a little help from our friends on the, on the other side of the fence line, so to speak. In, in the federal government, whether it be it directly through EPA or, or con, uh, ideally with congressional support, that would be ideal. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Ken? Well, I agree with that last one. I, I think some congressional involvement is gonna be critical because that's gonna be where the resources come come from, uh, whether it's a it's augmentation to USDA's uh, circuit rider, which I think is an excellent idea um, because nobody ever wanted to hear, hi, I'm from EPA and I'm here to, to help you. Uh, but, but we, you know, we're, we're very good as a nation in reacting to disasters instead of anticipating and avoiding them, um, if particularly you look at natural disasters. But I think if something terrible happened in the water sector, that's what you would see. You would see this huge ramp up uh, rather than, uh, and it would be in a, in a crisis response rather than in anticipating it. One of the things I think of in this sector, for example, is if you recall all the work and effort that went into the concerns about the Y2K transition and all of our computers were going to revert to 1900. And people look back at that and said, well, it was kind of a nothing burger. We didn't have a problem. Well, of course, we didn't have a problem because we anticipated it. We invested it in it and we made sure that it didn't happen. Now we're now we're going to have a situation where we have state actors out there who are probing ways to disrupt the U.S. economy. They don't really care, I don't believe, how they do it in the sense that they want to do is create uh, disruption in the U.S. economy, whether it's through the electric grid, the power sector, uh, we saw it with the oil pipeline, uh, and, and, and these opportunities are just out there. And I think that so we have to tell people that there's an obligation to address these. We need to be addressed preemptively uh, following on both what Kevin and Mark are saying. Um, and uh, and that case needs needs to be made, and uh, and we can use some of these prior efforts of the uh, of the government as uh, ways to work with this with the uh, the public sector, the the non federal sector, uh, to achieve those successes. Thank you, Mark. Thanks. Yeah. So I think the first and most important thing to say is, look, there's clearly a problem. So and I some people have trouble saying that out loud. There is clearly a problem. Nobody on this panel has that, but in both the executive branch and Congress, there is a sense of, well, you know, we get, we'll get to it. And uh, as Ken said, we're probably going to get to it in a crisis management mode if we're not careful here. We need to make the investments now. Um, you know, all, many of us on here watched us build DHS on the fly, the Department of Homeland Security, and now we have it warts and all. I mean, there are a lot of things that if we'd been able to build that deliberately and proactively, it had been a much different type of organization. So um, I really feel there's some, some opportunity here to think it, to, 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 to take action left of boom. Um, and, and for this, you know, I, and Ken reminds me, one of the reasons we have trouble here is there is an inherent distrust between uh, elements of Congress and the executor and the EPA. And, and much more so than you see in the other sector specific agencies. Uh, there's usually one off or two off senators who are currently mad at that agency, but that's not the same as a kind of a fairly persistent distrust of the agency that you feel. And, and we have to work our way around that with, um, with good governance arguments. And then there's also a sense of encroachment between committees and agencies. That the committees that are responsible for water feel that the committees that are responsible for Homeland Security have poached in the past. And and uh, and they're on the lookout for it, and it creates a sense of are you sh not sure we want to open up a can of worms of uh, an authorization here, and something else gets in, and so we got to work around that. These are bureaucratic um, challenges and barriers that can be overcome because there is a problem. And, and I I'd say finally, I do think uh, you know yesterday uh, or last week you and I um, uh, Samantha talked with uh, Chris Inglis. Uh, in an event. And I think the National Cyber Director can play a leadership role here in as, as kind of the, the one of the national risk managers, uh, particularly for the cyber end of this, in ensuring that we that we highlight, identify the challenge in in uh in water in the water and wastewater sectors 
and bring the executive and legislative branches together for a solution. I think he has that kind of deliberate, um, persistent leadership that's going to be necessary to tackle this. So a lot of barriers, uh, but I think in the end, the challenge is too significant to be ignored for another two, three, four years. Yeah, let me let me just say personally, so the Center for Cyber and Technology Innovation, um, where Mark and I are both at at FDD, have been writing about you know, issues of importance in cyber and technology for over five years. This report that, that Mark wrote, it, I have to say is, is one of the most important, if not the most important um, piece of work that we have put out. It, it is um, something that people's eyes have just not been open to. Um, and so I, I thank you personally, Mark. Um, but you know, look, everyone on this panel, uh, Kevin Morley, Ken Kaposis, again, Rear Admiral Mark Montgomery, um, thank you for, for your service to our country, for helping us highlight and, and for dealing with these issues um, in your own capacity, for taking time out today to talk with us. And for more information on FDD and our latest analysis, this and others, we encourage you to visit us at fdd.org. Um, and you can find out more information on the Cyberspace Solarium 2.0 project at cybersolarium.org. Um, so with that, we hope to see you again soon. And thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye.